welcome to another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. A lot going on in the region and in Israel these days, and I want to start with the biggest regional development in recent days, which is the conclusion in Beijing on Friday of a normalization agreement between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia under the aegis of uh, the People's Republic of China. Um, Iran and Saudi Arabia have agreed to restore their diplomatic relations for the first time since 2016. Um, and this is a big deal. Uh, this is a big deal first and foremost for the United States because what it shows more than anything else is that uh, spurned U.S. allies like Saudi Arabia uh, are looking for and finding other options for superpower allies, uh, in this case, uh, America's chief rival, China. Um, this is a big blow to America's position in the region and a big upgrade for China. Uh, that they're doing this. They're already the largest, I think, uh, purchaser of oil from, uh, for certainly from Iran and uh, increasingly from Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're using their soft power, their AI technologies and their 5G technologies, which they're industrializing, to bring more and more countries in the Middle East and throughout the world into the Belt and Road Initiative and into China's uh, economic zone. Uh, in uh, competition, of course, with the U.S. zone. We've already seen uh, the purchase of, um, of oil in yuan and in rubles, uh, which is uh, essentially canceling the petrodollar, the U.S. dollar as the currency for uh, global oil markets, uh, is now uh, no longer the king. Um, and this is, this is a big deal, and you would expect for the United States to be really upset about this, but uh, they're not, at least not officially. Uh, and I, by all counts, uh, not at all. The uh, administration and their um, their proxies have all said that they're totally fine with this. They think it's fantastic. Really, the only thing that they care about is the outcome. And they were supportive of a restoration of ties between Saudi Arabia and Iran all along. And they have no problem uh, with the fact that this was um, mediated by the Chinese. And And I think what's notable about this is that I actually believe the Americans. The, the Biden administration really doesn't care about the rise of China, not at the expense of the United States and not at all. If they did, they would be taking a whole host of actions, which they're not taking uh, both at home and abroad, to try to ward off and, and surmount the rising challenge that uh, China poses for the United States, both economically and strategically. I mean, for instance, just, you know, off the top of my head, uh, Rather than fight uh, Chinese uh, subversion of uh, Americans uh, in, through academia, through their various initiatives on college campuses, something that the Trump administration uh, worked to shut down, the Biden administration has opened it up. They've closed uh, investigations against U.S. academics that received money and grants from the Department of Defense and also received money and grants from China and didn't report uh, on the money that they were receiving from China. Um, these are steps that you wouldn't take if you were trying to compete with China or tamp down on Chinese power and influence. You would uh, be doing the kinds of things that my colleague and friend David Goldman has been calling for, screaming about for the past decade, which is uh, putting major investments, a trillion dollars, not in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, but in uh, uh, rebuilding and uh, expanding U.S. technological capabilities along the lines of the strategic defense initiative that the Reagan administration uh, carried out in 1983 to uh, defeat the Soviet Union. The United States would be investing that kind of money in research and development of U.S. technologies. Just last week, I think it was, the Wall Street Journal put out a study. They published a study that showed that uh, t China is now outpacing the United States, I think, in 37 out of 41 uh, technologies and scientific uh, areas, so that the Chinese are now surpassing the United States in science and technology, something that... Uh, U.S. elites have for generations poo-pooed the possibility of happening, and yet it is happening. It's happening now right in front of our eyes in the United States. Rather than fight this, they're uh, acting like it's no big deal. Again, you wouldn't think that the Americans uh, would act the way that they are, but um, manufacturing, is uh, the Biden administration doing anything to restore American manufacturing? No, nothing. Are they doing anything like the Trump administration did to enable... Uh, American energy independence. To the contrary, they're doing everything that they can to block American uh, energy independence, whether it's with national natural gas pipelines that they've shut down or fracking licenses that they're not giving on uh, federal lands and, and uh, everything in between. 
So uh, they're encouraging U.S. energy producers not to produce. They're not encouraging U.S. companies to re remove themselves back to the United States from abroad. Nothing. They're not doing anything that you would expect them to do. And so it's not surprising that here, too, the United States is not fi uh, f fighting in any way uh, Chinese encroachment in the Middle East. And then Iran. I mean, this is an agreement that absolutely en en empowers Iran. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I got a bit of a cold this week. Um, Iran wins from this, right? I mean, they've been wanting to uh, – be restored to the fold in the Middle East with the Arab states. And here, through the good offices of uh, the Chinese, uh, they are. This is a big this is a big bonanza for Iran, and the United States doesn't mind. Why doesn't it mind? I mean, I mean, just last week or 10 days ago, the director of the CIA, William Byrne, said that Iran is just 12 days away from nuclear breakout, whatever that means, how you cannot be at nuclear breakdown if you're 12 days away, and how the CIA knows how to say precisely 12 days and not 13 or 11, beyond me. But, you know, <laughs> I'm not a CIA officer, so maybe I don't have that uh, enlightenment required to understand uh, what that means, 12 days away from nuclear breakout. At any rate, you would think that the United States would be doing everything that they could to try to push the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear genie back in the bottle since they claim that they're uh, so opposed to Iran acquiring nuclear weapons, um, but they're not doing anything of the sort. To the contrary, we see <clears throat> that efforts, interest, I mean, very clear, keen interest that the British and the EU have expressed in applying economic sanctions to the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, to designating the IRGC as a terrorist organization. The United States, the Biden administration, is actually actively working to undermine their efforts to designate the IRGC as a terrorist organization. So the United States is standing by happily watching, doing nothing as Iran gets more empowered, as it uh, is brought back into the fold of the Middle East, as it expands its strategic alliance with, with, uh, with China, with Russia, as it supplies the weapons of war to Russia to maintain its war of attrition against uh, Ukraine. While the United States is not capable today industrially to replenish the stores that it's emptying out by supplying Ukraine in this war. So, you know, the United States is not acting like a superpower that's concerned about either maintaining its position, protecting its allies, preventing its enemies from increasing their power, whether that enemy is the People's Republic of China or the Islamic Republic of Iran. So, um, where does that leave us, right? I mean, it leaves Israel in a perfect storm. Last week, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu went to Rome. This week, he's supposed to be going to Berlin to lobby European leaders to do what they want to do, which is to designate the IRGC as a terrorist organization, among other things, and to end the nuclear diplomacy that they continue to carry out through the EU and that Rob Malley is carrying out through the Iraqi regime and others. Uh, to try to empower Iran still further through the uh, cancellation of sanctions, even as Iran strides towards the nuclear finish line. So Netanyahu, we've seen that he's trying to fight this diplomatically through his shuttle diplomacy to Europe. He's trying to fight this diplomatically with soft power. Last week, he gave an interview to Iran International. That's the uh, television uh, network that broadcasts into Iran in Farsi. Um, that uh, was forced to leave London, where they were headquartered until just a couple of weeks ago, and moved to Washington uh, at a moment's notice because they were under uh, critical threat from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which Britain, again, wants to designate as a terrorist organization. But the U.S., despite the fact that the IRGC is operating in the United States to kill uh, former U.S. Uh, uh, officials like, Mompe like Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, National Security Advisor, uh, John Bolton, and even former President Trump. Um, the Biden administration is pushing the Europeans not to designate the IRGC as a terrorist organization and uh, impose the sanctions related to such a designation uh, by Europe. Um, so Netanyahu is going to the Iranian people, speaking to them directly in a, in a very important interview that was broadcast into Iran last Thursday night. So he's talking to the Europeans, he's talking to the Iranian people, and um, 
He is giving the IDF and Israel's uh, security apparatuses the uh, means, financial and, and material, they need in order to uh, carry out a military strike against Iran's nuclear installations to, again, push, push Iran back, to push them back, to prevent them from crossing the nuclear threshold from becoming a nuclear power. Netanyahu told the uh, a interview, a interviewer in uh, Iran International, and he said on many occasions um, that he's only returned to office. He only decided to return to office to take care of the Iranian nuclear threat, and he's absolutely committed to doing that, and I think we can trust him. I know we can trust him on this score. Uh, but all of this is happening um, at a terrible time uh, inside in Israel. I don't think that there's anything here that's just happening by chance. I think we've spoken here on this program and uh, in uh, at JNS about the fact that uh, the United States is funding through the State Department one of the central nodes of the uh, revolutionary violence that we're seeing on the part of the left against the uh, government, the Netanyahu government, and against the coalition and against the Knesset. Uh, the Movement for Quality government has been receiving direct support from the U.S. State Department. Uh, every single senior member of the administration, from Biden and Kamala Harris to Secretary of State Blinken, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, last week it was Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense, have all essentially sided with the rioters on the streets of Israel against the Netanyahu government, uh, saying that the Netanyahu government uh, shouldn't. It's anti-democratic for the democratically elected government of Israel to pass uh, in a lawful way, uh, measures in parliament that uh, uh, realign the, the balance of power by placing minimal limitations on judicial power in Israel. Um, the secret, the uh, ambassador here, Tom Nides, has broken broken every diplomatic convention <laughs> essentially by openly interfering in Israel's domestic affairs, uh, telling Netanyahu, uh, treating the Netanyahu. Re re uh, relating to him as a child, saying, I speak to the Israeli government as I speak to my children, he said in a, in a podcast with David Axelrod, um, and say, you have to pump on the brakes on this judicial reform. You mustn't pass it. Um, and meeting very openly with leaders of the riots outside uh, in Tel Aviv and throughout the country, acting not as the opposition to the government, but as the resistance, as if the government is an illegal, unlawful, illegitimate occupying power of their country. Um, and uh, so the United States is very clearly supporting this. Somebody, <coughs> somebody on the outside, on the inside in Israel, outside of Israel, uh, we know a lot of outside groups, both in the EU and the American Jewish community through the New Israel Fund, are funding this, they say so openly. Um, and this is not simply a demonstration. This isn't a mass rally of people who are getting up. They're being pushed up. Somebody is directing this. This costs hun you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. This isn't a joke. This is a huge production. I mean, just you know, every flag that they bring out into their rallies that they're bringing in on rented trains, on rented uh, trucks to Tel Aviv to hand out, each one of those flags costs at least $10. And we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of flags that they're buying and distributing at every rally. So, I mean, just that alone is an, is an outlay that, you know, no Likud rally has ever seen. Somebody is paying for this. Somebody is directing it. I don't know who, but there are a lot of people involved, and they're not all in Israel, and I'm not even sure most of them are in Israel. But this is an attack on the Jewish state from inside. And, and this brings me to, you know, what we talked about last week, which was the pilots from a key, perhaps the most operational squadron in the Israel Air Force, saying that they want to, um, that they're not going to serve in reserves. They're not going to serve in reserves at a time when, you know, I mean, as I s laid out, you know, the, the, top, the clock is ticking down on Iran, and Israel's going to have to operate now, in the next two months, I mean, the Saudi-Iranian deal, the one out for Israel is that it only goes into effect in two months, so we have eight weeks to act. Because once we let those two months pass without acting, uh, Saudi Arabia may be unreachable. So we don't have a lot of time to act. And in the meantime, somebody is fomenting 
uh, internal dissent and, and effectively trying to, 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 to incite a civil war here. And, um, and, and how do we see this playing out? But I want to just uh, spend the next uh, last couple of minutes of this opening to talk about, you know, what what to do in this situation. How do you pull people back from the brink? How do you get pilots, you know, who who are Zionist, but are in a state of panic and hysteria and fear, to walk away from the edge and to come back and to rejoin Israeli society and uh, the people who are protecting this country? Again, at, and this is a perfect storm at a town where we, we are about, you know, H hour uh, plus eight weeks, right, of taking care of Iran's nuclear installations and blocking Iran from becoming a nuclear uh, weapons uh, wielding state. Um, and I think the answer is A, even though they won't come and they won't speak to the right, um, I think it's very important that we pass very quickly uh, the judicial reform based on some of the compromise proposals that have been put forward by Professor Yuval Vashan, uh, Giora Island, uh, former Justice Minister uh, Daniel Friedman, uh, to use that as a basis for uh, the laws that are going to be passed by the Knesset. And I think that, you know, and making clear, and that they should be making clear that this is not a usurpation of power. This is not a regime change, except in the sense that you're abrogating an oligarchy and you're, and you're reinforcing Israel democratic norms across the three branches of government in Israel. Um, and past that, you know, we can revisit this later. But to then I really believe, you know, and I've been saying this to colleagues and friends, and I think it's time for me to say it here. I mean, I think what we're missing is a, is a speech by Prime Minister Netanyahu, where he speaks to the people of Israel and anybody else who wants to listen. And he brings us together by reminding us of, of what Zionism is and how all of us have played a role in building this country and how sacred it is to everybody across the political spectrum and the sociological spectrum. And why it is that this judicial reform came about. It came about because the judiciary has seized the powers of the representatives of this people, and it has hurt community after community in this country through its usurpation of power. It's hurt the, the denizens of South Tel Aviv, the working class neighborhoods of Tel Aviv that have been overwhelmed by uh, violent uh, criminal, often illegal aliens from Africa who have uh, who have trespassed our border and transformed their communities into urban crime zones, and the and the Supreme Court has sided with with them against the citizens of Israel. It has trounced the the rights of of uh, the disabled. It has trounced the rights of the Ethiopian community. It has trounced the rights of the ultra-Orthodox, of the religious Zionists. It has trounced the rights of Arab Israelis. All of these different groups have been harmed. It has trounced the rights of Israeli businesses by seizing the power to, to interpret uh, uh, contracts, making Israel ranked below South Sudan and Saudi Arabia in terms of the security that people can have when they... Uh, signed deals with Israeli companies that their contracts are going to be respected by the courts in Israel. They have undermined our ability to develop our national resources. We were one vote away from the Supreme Court blocking uh, Israel from uh, developing our natural gas uh, deposits in the East Mediterranean. Um, all of these things are, are actions that the Supreme Court has taken because there haven't been any limits placed on their power. And Netanyahu has to give a speech and explain why this has become necessary and explain what it does. And then he has to rally the people together again, based on our common Zionist heritage, our Jewish heritage, and our belief and attachment to this country. And he has to rally us for what lays ahead. Lays ahead not in the distant future, but now, which is our need to contend with in a military, in a military fashion 
through military means, Iran's efforts to become a nuclear power. And, you know, there are 99 ways to skin a cat, and there are 99 ways to achieve this aim. But we have to use all 99 of them now in the coming weeks, because otherwise, otherwise we're going to face all of this, and it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse inside, and it's going to get worse outside. As a riven people, we're not going to have the ability to contend with this. So I think time is of the essence. We are indeed all brothers. We're angry at each other. But that doesn't mean that we're not part of the same people and family and that we have both a common past, a common present, and a common future. And that's the job of the prime minister to stand up and explain this to the Israeli people. I think we have to, again, pass a compromise, bring in as many people as we can, and then the prime minister has to speak to the Israeli people about why this is important and why we're doing it together. So those are my thoughts, and now let's talk a little bit about the psychosis of the left and what it is that stands at the root of everything that we're facing today with my friend and colleague, Amnon Lord. As we've been discussing now for weeks, the left in Israel is basically, I mean, I, I don't even know whether we can discuss what's happening today on a political level or whether we have to go into a psychological level. Um, but I think that the issue of the left in Israel, um, what's happening to it, how it views uh, its relationship to the rest of Israeli society is really one of the key issues of our time. Uh, and I, uh, I uh, want to talk about this with the person who I think understands the left better than uh, most in Israel, perhaps better than any of my very close friends. So uh, I asked my friend Amnon Lord uh, from Israel Ayom to join me today to discuss the situation uh, of the Israeli left in Israel, which is calling for civil war. It's calling for people to take their money out of Israel. It's calling for... Uh, soldiers not to obey orders, for policemen not to obey orders. It's calling for, a, it, it's in a state of general revolt. Um, so I asked my friend uh, Amnon Lord from Israel Ayom to join me today. I think this is a repeat performance for him on or appearance for you on uh, the Carolyn Glick Show. Thanks so much for joining me today, Amnon. Thank you for having me, uh, Carolyn. It's a pleasure to to be here and to try again my old tricks. <laughs> Your old tricks in English. Well, um, I, I, like I said, you know, we no, have... No, in, in analyzing the left. In analyzing the left. Yeah, well, it, it maybe you, you have to resort to trickery because the left is acting in a way that uh, is so subversive. And um, so, I mean, we have everybody from Ehud Barak to the Attorney General to... All sorts of people undermining the government, saying it's not legitimate, acting as though it's not legitimate, calling for you know, former presidents of the Supreme Court, Aaron Barak and Dorit Bainish and others, essentially calling for a civil war. And, um, and, and the media is involved with this in a very serious way, leading the efforts to almost brainwash the public into yes, thinking yes. that... <clears throat> They're There's facing no the most dangerous. How do you explain? What do you look at it? First of all, how first do you see all, it? they broke the civil uh, discourse. Uh, you don't. It's very rare. I can. Uh, there are some people that I manage to have civil dis uh, discussion with them about uh, the problems, even among the the other side, among the the leftists, because some of them do agree that uh, the power should return to the people, to the Knesset, from the power grab that the uh, Supreme Court did. But still, they are torn within the, themselves. They belong to the, to the other camp, to the camp of, you know, because the other side is, uh, or the, those who so-called protest, but in a way they are in a, in a frenzy of uh, political warfare against their brethren, against the, the legal, uh, government, uh, they are torn. They, they they are part of the of the camp that uh, they are leftists, but some of them do agree at the same time that what Yariv Levin tries to do is correct to take some of the Supreme Court power 
and get it back to the Knesset. See, one of the things that I found really disturbing over the past couple of weeks was the second speech that President Herzog gave. In the first speech that he gave several weeks ago, um, the most important contribution that he made wasn't his specific offer for how to reform the judiciary, um, which I, I didn't like and I, and I didn't think it was realistic for a number of reasons, but he did two things, President Herzog, in his first speech that were extremely important. The first one was that he recognized the legitimacy of the elected government and that there are election results. And the second thing is that we have this oligarchical judiciary that chooses its own members that isn't limited in any way. The scope of its powers, all they do is seize more and more powers and there are no limits on it. And he recognized that there have to be limits on it. So those were two very important things. But last week, he gave a very angry speech where he demanded that the Knesset stop the legislative process for judicial reform. And it was it was very surprising to me. And I didn't understand where it was coming from. And, and I want, want to know how you explain it. And I also want to understand another thing, which one of the most remarkable things that I found about the left in this current iteration of sort of a meltdown on its part is that there's no disagreement in the ranks. You know, in the, in the right, you have everybody from, from secular to ultra-Orthodox, from, you know, socialist to, you know, ultra-free market capitalism, uh, libertarian, social conservative. You have everything. But, and everybody argues with one another. And on the left, it doesn't seem it's the uniformity here is is First stunning. First of all, I, I think that uh, Herzog was overwhelmed and shaken by the events of the of that day. Uh, you know, they used the same terminology as the Palestinians: a day of rage, day resistance, day of resistance, as though they're uh, they're acting like uh, an army behind the lines. Be behind enemy lines. Now he belongs to a certain kind of uh, social uh, milieu. Uh, milieu, social roots. He was, uh, in a way, he returned to become the president of the left. He was head of the labor. He was uh, assistant, first assistant or secretary of the government of uh, Ehud Barak. He was very close to Barak. He, they were even, uh, you know, they stole horses together <laughs> in the elections of 1999. Right, yeah. you're, you're, so I think he's still under the uh, Barak uh, influence in some ways. And Barak is the true leader of this entire uh, operation. Is he, does he think that he can, he, he managed to galvanize the entire uh, spectrum of people in Israel who are not belong, who do not belong to the Likud and the right wing uh, uh, coalition. And this, is, this, this group in Israel is, is composed by, you know, on various dimensions. The first dimension is uh, social and historical. They feel, they claim that they build this, this country it belongs to them, and now that you took it over, you means the deplorables plus people of color, people who came from the Arab lands, people who came from uh, Machanot, from the camps. We let you play with democracy for a few years. Now that you have taken over, we are not going to let you uh, rule. We are going to break the entire uh, uh, connections between the wheel and the, the steering wheel and the wheels of the car and uh, this is our land we we own it we we established the state we were the the heroic uh, pilots in uh, various points during the the history of uh, of the country that's one dimension the other dimension is the old uh, leftist uh, and and socialist uh, tradition. In the early 50s, they were, Israel also was uh, on the verge of civil war. 
because uh, the extreme le left, who was also extremely Stalinist, there was, like today, a, a, a crack up along the, the line of, is Israel going to the, to the West, to America, or is it going to go to Stalin, to, to the Soviet Union? And on that issue, the entire kibbutz movement, the, the crown of Zionism was split. Kibbutzim split between them. Families split. People couldn't talk to each other. Daughters, uh, there are various testimonies of uh, old people, uh, teachers who looked at uh, the eyes of their daughters, their, their literal daughters, and they saw them like uh, they thought they were, they were like those children who were kidnapped to the Tsar's army. That's the... Ben-Gurion called it Shmad Rusi. Shmad. That they Russian, were annihilated. Russian Shmad, annihilation. No, not annihilation. Shmad, but in the Jewish uh, context. Yeah, that they were destroying Judaism. Shmad, not, hash, not extermination. Shmad is, you know, when you, you lose your Jewishness right. to your Jew... Yevsektia, do you know? Yeah, it's, it's a Russian the, term. You it's know, the Jewish <laughs> section of, that's the, the, term of the NKVD used. that the, they used that to the, just annihilate Jewish he, life he, in the Soviet Union. He called the uh, not physical annihilation, no, 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 spiritual, spiritual annihilation. annihilation. Yes. He called certain schools as schools of Yevsektia. That's in the early 50s. But it wasn't this kind of movement, uh, but still, you know, it, it's, it's ironic. The Histadut, the, the trade union. unions, the labor union uh, federations is not joining forces with this uh, movement of uh, crazies on the, on the roads because most of the what left from the proletarian, from the working class in Israel are right wing. Right. And they also know that if they break the Israeli economy, they will have no uh, means for living. So. As long as the as the histadrut, the right, this government the, of free market can trust the histadrut more than they can trust the police. Can you imagine? And the army. And the army. No, the, I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say so. Uh, the fact but here, that let me let me give you two things that that stood out <coughs> to me this past week. Okay, <coughs> the first thing that stood out to me, and and I'm talking about in the last three days. All right. Is, we're taping this on Sunday, is that on Saturday night, Kobe Shabtai, the inspector general of the, uh, of the police, he gets up, he gives this primetime press conference. On Friday, he and public security minister Itamar Ben-Gvir decided that they were going to uh, remove the head of the Tel Aviv command of the of the police from his duty because he's completely failed uh, to, to deal with anything. And um, this was Thursday, actually. And uh, then on Thursday night, the attorney general, Gali Barav Miara, who was appointed by Giron Saar, who is one of the most active members of the resistance, um, she, without any basis in law, intervened on behalf of the... She's the law. She's not a servant of the law. Right, but she's not the law, because the law says that the... No, of I mean, course it's a, not, but, no, but this it's is important how it to works point in out. Israel. According to Israeli law, the public security minister can remove a policeman or officer from his position at any time. So they agreed, the inspector general of police and the police minister, to remove the, palace, the the Tel Aviv district commander from his position, give him another job in charge of training, um, and um, and she objected, right? Yeah. And she objected, and then on Saturday night, the inspector general of police gave this uh, press conference where he looked like a deer caught in somebody's headlights, and he gave this almost incomprehensible statement where he was still moving, but it was going to be after Ramadan, and um, and he made a mistake, and 
um, and then talk about how, how horrible he feels about coming down hard on the rioters who are blocking traffic at major highway junctions in, in Israel. Um, and it, and it, was a, it, was a, it was a very, I mean, it was cowardly, but it was also terrifying to watch this. And then on the other hand, you had in the army, you had uh, what I was talking about with Brigadier General Amir Avivi last week's show, about the pilots who said that they weren't going to serve. And then they kind of walked that back. And then the uh, commander of the Air Force, I think also on Thursday, relieved the ringleader of those pilots who said they were going to stop flying um, from his duties. And then, like, he reversed course the next day. Yes, yes. So, I mean, it, it, you, you see that they try to stand up to them. And then both the chief of staff of the IDF and the inspector general of the police crumpled. That's, uh, first of all, it's very worrying, you know, that in Israel today, the government does not, it, it does not quite command or have full control of the armed forces, the IDF, the police, Shabak. They cannot, you cannot, this is what's terrifying the citizens. Can they trust the, the armed forces? This is why people are, live in such anxiety. In Israel today, there is uh, anxiety. You agree with me, oh, right? Oh, yes, very much so. They managed to, to drive it to the, to the consciousness of the, of the citizens. Now, the, uh, that, that goes together with the other dimension of uh, this uh, uh, gathering of forces. It's not only social and historical or ideological history of the left, it's also the Israeli ruling class, the elites joining together in a way to, uh, to harm the economy and what they already, they didn't manage to harm the economy so far. That's interesting. But they do manage to harm uh, security, internal security in Israel. There, there's no doubt about it. We don't know anymore. Well, I trust the IDF. Most of the, of the units, of the, you know, ground units are, uh, are loyal, are simple people. But you, you can see now, and it's very sad to watch, who would have believed that the IDF, the people of the army of the people would become a class military. You understand? You see what I mean? There are classes here. There are the, the Givati fighter in Hebron who was thrown to jail because of something that he said. And this colonel in, uh, in, in the, the Air, Air Force, Force who should have spent the next 20 years in jail and instead he's, uh, he's back in, his, in, same, uh, in the same position that he was before. And he's doing a double job. He's both a commander in the Air Force, in the Miluim, in the reserve. In the at, the at the same time, he's one of the leaders of the riots against the, the government, against the, uh, the legal government that should control as a civilian or as a political echelon over the, the military. So you talk about the ruling class, and I mean, that's, that's really, you know, so much of this, right? Is that, you know, they, they pretend that this is a popular movement, but really all of the people yes. in the streets are rallying on behalf of the most powerful forces in Israeli the ex -military, society. ex-military generals, ex-commanders in the police, and Mossad. High-tech high uh, chieftains. Moguls. Yeah. High-tech high moguls, uh, ex-judiciary people, you name it, the entire, and especially the, uh, the, media. the media. The media is, uh, it's like uh, Lenin uh, in his, uh, you know, the simple instructions for how to handle a, ma a revolution. You have to control the broadcasting station or the telegraph. Genghis Khan with the telegraph station. But you, 
this one thing that uh, the Israeli ruling class don't have to make any effort, it already entrenched in the Israeli media for, for generations, Ever. forever. <laughs> and you don't have, you know, you can have quite a few right-wing uh, reporters and, uh, in the media, but you need only a few, the, the, those with the, that gets airtime, that, that spells what's going on, that, uh, you know, they, they follow with their cameras, uh, hours on end to of the riots you know the so uh, they they're definitely part of it if if they if they didn't collaborate with the rioters uh, it would quiet down but i think still uh, since they lost the the collaboration of the histadrut i think they will try to go as far as they can to create some kind of explosion, but they won't be able to paralyze the Israeli economy. And in time of emergency, uh, the moving parts will coalesce together and uh, I won't say everything will be okay. I do believe it will. But the thing is, is that, you know, we were talking about before we started recording and, and this is really just so apparent to people who live here, but it's not to people outside, which is that... Because Jews in, in the States don't, they don't like to hear those things in the past. They didn't like to hear it they, because it doesn't paint a nice picture of the Israeli society. You know, I was talking to somebody mm. who, who will remain nameless, but somebody who is extremely pro-Israel in the United States. And he said to me, um, look, I don't really want to hear about it, and I don't want to know about it. And uh, evangelicals love Israel because uh, this y you're God's chosen people, and um, and Israel is the is the uh, embodiment uh, or proof that God keeps His word. And this story doesn't doesn't gel with the way that you know people think of Israel as a symbol. <laughs> And what you're showing us with this is that you're human beings. And, and in a way, it's like it's against the anti-Semites and the philo-Semites that we're actually acting like human beings. But I think, you know, part of this also is that what's happening in Israel is happening in America. You know, I mean, it, it, it's almost like they're following the Trump resistance playbook to a T, right? I mean, Trump was elected. And instead of being an opposition, which is what you always had, right? If the Democrats are in power, then the Republicans are the opposition and vice versa. But Trump gets in and on his on his inauguration day, they began their resistance. And it was a resistance. And it was that the United States had been occupied, right, by a hostile, illegitimate force <laughs> and therefore uh, doing things that under, in older times when things were clearer, would have been considered treasonous was suddenly a mark of valor. And you're getting that here as well. So that what we're experiencing here is something that's much bigger than Israel. But in Israel's case, it's because it, we face so many external threats, it's, it's exceedingly uh, uh, dangerous. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I think what's happening in Israel, it's a bit like the other way. Uh, what happened in Brazil after Bolsonaro uh, lost. lost, there was a s storming of the parliament. So we don't have really a s s storming in the parliament, but of the parliament, but we have something similar only from the left. And I already, I think that today in our days, in, in some ways it's a, it's a fascistic movement that we're living, but on the left lane, if you want to be a modern, fascist you have to cry democracy and drive in the left lane if you drive in the right lane you will uh, tackle various uh, obstacles so choose your uh, what, what you want i think the fact that they all think i, I experience it personally people that i know from the other side because my past is my past i have friends from the kibbutz, from the left, 
they pressure me personally, almost uh, beg me to, uh, to save the day, to, to come out against uh, Bibi. Stay where you are, but at least here, say, write in your, uh, in your column that uh, everything should freeze. Something like this. It's uh, quite a psychological uh, pressure. Uh, some of the people I, I noticed, that uh, people from old friendships, who, people who think completely the opposite fr from me, ex-kibbutzniks or uh, people from the kibbutzim, they remain uh, loyal friends. They think different from me. They ask me to uh, to return to to, to the fall. Bechuva, <laughs> but it's completely different. Uh, they keep being friendly. Other people, they who were friends, hurt me. You know, really stabbed me in the in the most. Uh, hurtful way now you mean right now what's going on now yeah it's it is it's hard to understand how politics can become such a powerful psychological force that it, it really there is something Be very totalitarian about it's it it's totalitarian and it's also on a level and on an atavistic tribal level I'll give you an example from today. It's not political, but it's uh, social. Just today I met a woman who incidentally was born in the, in the same kibbutz that I was born. She left with her parents already before I was born, but it was enough uh, for us to bond together, to feel uh, some kind kinship. of uh, kinship, very close kinship, just because she was born with in the, the group that uh, established the kibbutz and I remembered her uh, father. It's hard to explain. It's like uh, finding a, a relative. And now I'm sure she thinks completely different from me. But, but and so on that level, you can understand the bondage that they have together, uh, the the nucleus of this group, you know, this is the why some writers say, and they write unashamedly, this is ours, we're not, it's like their old plantation, you will not enter here. You know, years ago, over 20 years ago, I interviewed a uh, major general in the army, Uri Segi, who was the uh, intelligence, uh, head of intelligence director about Oslo. And he compared the religious uh, Zionists in Israel to uh, um, a faulty product on a product line. And he said, you know, we are the Mayflower flower generation. And it was a very strange statement because it was so, it's like no American you can practically think of would want to so say that. It's so undemocratic and, and, un and they, shameful. They're, they're, but they're shameless. Like they don't. I saw a video uh, last night that uh, was posted sometime over Shabbat, I think. I don't even remember who, who it was who gave it, but this guy who was one of the heads of the, uh, of, the, of the resistance. He gives this whole sociological explanation of the resistance, and he says it's, this is a fight about the Jewish story. So he started this first story was the story of the Bible, the second story was a story of the, uh, you know, in Jerusalem and the temple and the rituals of the temple. And then after the destruction of the second temple, we became a diaspora people. And it was the story of, uh, of, um, of the Talmud and the oral tradition. And then Zionism is the third Jewish narrative. And Zionism means that we're supposed to be a liberal democracy, albeit Jewish, but not too Jewish. And now... These people, these people, and he specifically was talking about the religious Zionists, who aren't even the majority of the people in the government, and they're not leading it, but whatever. They want to change it completely. They want to turn Israel into a halachic state. 
uh, that they want to rebuild the temple or whatever. And the weirdest thing about what he said is that his rendition of the Zionist tale was wrong. I mean, he, he was saying that the Zionist revolution and the Jewish people and the establishment of Israel had nothing to do with, with Judaism or messianism or anything else. I mean, um, as, as our friend Gershon Akoin always says, you know, he quotes chapter and verse of Ben-Gurion, is quite messianic and, and, and very Jewish. And you, and you look at, and they say that the Declaration of Independence is the document, but there's nothing in the, decu, the Declaration of Independence is, doesn't give any basis for anything that they're saying. Of course not. I think, uh, l let's say it's not only against the Jewishness of the state, but, you know, ju Justice uh, Itzhak Zamir, a few decades ago, the, the problem of... Uh, uh, of Sarbanut, how you call it? Uh, of refusing uh, orders. Refusing uh, orders to go to Lebanon right. or the occupied territories. It started in full volume like in 1982 with Yesh Gul. So but in later on, he said, just as Zamir said completely in a discussion with some of the people who, who were pro uh, Sarbanut, that. Uh, this is one kind of threat, one kind of danger that, that people should not place on the Jewish state. You, we have various threats, not only on the Jewish state, and democracy. You, the, he, he, he stressed that in 1990, it's, it's in a book called uh, Gvulot Atziyut or something. Yeah, it was published by of, uh, of, 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 obedience. Uh, of obedience, and he stated or this the is limits of obedience. this is the kind of danger that no one should place on an Israel and the Israeli society and the Israeli democracy. You shouldn't do it. You you endanger. It's an existential danger of the state, and now. It's like being played played out in such a careless way, you know. It's uh, this kind of carelessness is really uh, a feel something that I don't have really a real explanation. Why generals in the ex generals in the military or Prime Minister uh, Olmert or Ron Khuldayi, who is the mayor of Tel Aviv, or or Ehud Barak, why are they uh, willing to to incite such sedition and and incite uh, you know miluimnikim reservists uh, not not to uh, not to obey orders? It, it's something that's beyond belief for Israel in this in our condition under a terrorist attack and with the threat of, of Iran to do it, is it suicidal? What, what is it? Well, what do you think? I mean, it is, it does, as I said at the outset of our conversation, this is more psychological than anything else. H it, how do it, you? It's not just particular. I think if you, if we go all the way and you make the Israeli state collapse, from this uh, chaos, you can you can steer things in the in the farthest direction, even including uh, uprooting maybe two thousand uh, settlers from uh, from Judea and Samaria. Two thousand, two hundred thousand, a few hundred thousands. I think if there is an emergency uh, government coming out of this mess, there could be uh, some kind of, uh, they really dream because they don't see any way to get back to, to government, to rule. They, can't, they understand that they cannot win elections. They do have a chance to do it, but they don't believe it. They think it's, there is a, demographic determination against them and they will they are not uh, be, they will not be able to win any election in the future 
And I think that the only way to steer things their own way is doing it by force. So, I mean, Tamir Pardo, the former director of the Mossad, said it fairly clearly in an interview that he gave, uh, I think, on Thursday night to Ilana Dayan on the, on the uh, you know, Pravda-like uh, show Truth on <laughs> Channel 12. Um, and he said that, uh, one, you know, this is much bigger than judicial reform. If we succeed in blocking the government's plans to place limits on judicial authority. We're not going to end with that. We also, you know, there are also issues of um, of uh, the Judaism in the state and also uh, regarding the Palestinians that we want. And we so see all the PLO there, flags. So there you go. There you go. You have a few tar targets. The Jude Judaizing Israel. of Israel, uh, uprooting the settlers, and creating a a Palestinian state. If you create, if everything goes chaotic, this would be the end game. I don't believe they will get there. I don't see it, you know, it's not such a great uh, end game to, to reach. But this, when you mentioned the Pardo, right? I think this uh, brings us back to the social issues. There are a couple of uh, security uh, institutions which carries with them the, the social fabric from the old times. Like he came from Sayeret Matkal, right? Sayeret Matkal. That's the IDF's General Staff Commando Unit. That's what Yoni Netanyahu uh, commanded. Yeah, it's the That's elite, what uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was the in. The elite unit. And this was and there was uh, this uh, series in uh, Channel 13 about uh, the history of, uh, right. of their operations. It's a kind of unit that was uh, created uh, with, with the thought of preserving the, the spirit of the Palmach. Palmach was, you could call it the Red Brigade. When it was dismantled by Ben Gurion, in uh, 1948, uh, some of the leaders of Mapam, who was the Stalinist the uh, party, which was a very strong party, one of them, Yaakov Hazan, said, uh, if there will be a prime minister with the, named Begin, he called him Begin, the Palmach will not obey orders and I will not see it as a negative uh, thing. Symbolically, you can say, the Palmach is resurrected now, and it will not obey orders. Now, the head, the one who established Seret Matkal, his name was uh, Avraham Arnan. He was a soldier in the fourth uh, battalion of the, of the Palmach. It was a very uh, unique battalion under the command of Yitzhak, uh, no. Yosef Tabenkin, the head of uh, Yitzhak Tabenkin, the big leader of the kibbutz movement and one of the old Stalinists. And, uh, you know, I remember when I wrote about it in the past, I, all, I, I still had a, ch uh, a chance to talk to Gandhi, Rehavam Zevi. He knew the unit from the start. He knew Avraham Arnan. He said, yes, there is a meaning to the fact that Arnan came from uh, the force battalion. I also spoke with uh, Dovik Tamari, who really brought the, the unit into its own. You know, before Dovik Tamari, it wasn't uh, such a professional uh, unit. And he, he, he himself said, yes, it was, uh, we, we sort of adapted the, the external uh, uh, looks and the uh, fighting spirit of the Tzanchanim, the paratroopers, but we tried to emulate the, the spirit of the Palmach, the, who was already, it was already during the state years. And uh, definitely, the, it was Haver Mevi Haver. A friend brings a friend. Most of the unit, like everybody said in the past, there were people from the kibbutz, because there may be already 
objective reasons for war. But the spirit remained for many years. Now it's different, but you can see that this was a, a machinery for creating leadership, elite leadership. Three prime ministers came from the unit. You're talking about a few hundreds. There is no country where a small unit bring, bring out from it uh, three prime ministers, heads of the Mossad, uh, chief of staffs. It's not natural. Something is wrong there maybe in this kind of... Uh, maybe we should disperse a unit. That's something different. The same with uh, the Air Force. The Air Force for many years, up until uh, I think maybe 82, it's 50% of the pilots, maybe even more, were also uh, people who were born on the kibbutz, kibbutzniks. This is why when I spoke years ago with uh, the mythological head of the, the Shin Bet, of the security service, years after he retired, Amos Mano. Mm -hmm. In the 50s, when he took over from uh, Israel, they made huge efforts to, to woo the Americans, to prove to the Americans that we have great uh, uh, shushu services. Intelligence you, services. Intelligence services. And y you can see that we were something. And he said to me on the phone, I remember it, uh, for some reason, he was very frank. The Americans in the early 50s saw Israel, he said, as pink. Not pink. red, but pink. And he mentioned also that they knew that uh, if half the Air Force is from kibbutzim who are actually Stalinists, who knows what kind of stuff uh, they have it, well, they have here. Let me ask you a question, because we're... Uh, uh, but, uh, but it's all changed, but it's and did not change because you see the main uh, leaders of tho those uh, refuseniks or are from the the pilots. So let me let me and also from Sayyid Makal they had a, a, yeah. a letter. But I mean we are it, it. I thought that it had reached a critical mass when the head of the Air Force fired the pilot who was the ringleader. But then he was reinstated the next day. And so I was feeling very optimistic going into Shabbat because I thought, okay, you know, they're, the IDF is walking away from this. And then on uh, Saturday night when uh, the inspector general, you know, gave this panic state statement, it made me think, I, I don't know. And, and now in our conversation, I mean, these is there nothing that these people will stop at? I, I mean... Is there a way people are talking about, you know, can we negotiate something? Who would we negotiate with? I mean, Lapid is a perfect politician for a judicial oligarchy because he has no brain. And he is absolutely just lighting more and more fire. I don't um, see that there is a chance What's to... the end goal? Wait, let me just ask you. What is, what is an end game for these... You told me what the end game for these people is, which is essentially just a, a takeover of Israel and transformation of this country into yes, something post-Jewish and and, dis and terribly uh, horrible. For them, there are just too many Jews in the Jewish state. Right. So the question <laughs> is, um, you know, what what it, what is the government supposed to do? I mean, the government also is becoming a little bit shell shocked by all of this. I don't think but that they. Had I thought think that they, it would they, get like of this. Of course not. I think nobody envisioned such a situation. But I do think that still they have the, the legitimacy. They, they want a clear majority. The, unfortunately for uh, Judge Amit, they counted the votes. <laughs> he shouldn't have counted them. Right. They counted the votes. And so there is a basic legitimacy, and I think that uh, the court understand it. And so w what they should do in, the, in order to prevail is first to hold their own, to wear them out, and to go with, with, this, with the mitve, with, with the... Compromise, with an offer of a compromise. With, with the pl with uh, Yariv Levin's uh, plan, not Simcha Rotman is bringing too many 
too many laws on board. It should be minimal by the, by the plan of Yariv Levin. Things that can bring back the power to the Knesset. Right. The, the committee to choose, uh, to, to nominate judges. Uh, uh, the, the clause of reasonability, uh, judicial. Maybe a, another one or two uh, items. But for instance, tomorrow, Ben Gvir wants to uh, bring, to start legislating the chassinut for uh, immunity, immunity for soldiers. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't, because the government should uh, appear completely on the side of the rule of law. We only want to correct things, to, to fix things, to get democracy on track, but, to, but the government is not against the rule of law. And this kind of legislation is, is no good. It's something that hinders the real thing that the, the government wants to do. It's a distraction. It's not just a distraction. He broadcasts that maybe this government is not really adhering to the rule of law. If you, what kind of a law is it that uh, you give immunity to soldiers? You have to, there, there are various ways to handle violations by soldiers, but you don't, you, you shouldn't legislate a law that uh, from the outset will, will give immunity to, to soldiers. It will create maybe a wave of violence. I don't know. I, I don't I, I, I disagree be. with that, but I don't I don't really think that that's the issue. I think that the issue really is, um, you know, not standing down. I feel personally that, you know, the thing that's missing most is Netanyahu's voice in this. I think that he should really deliver a speech uh, reminding us of how we got here in the first place and of talking about where he wants to lead the country. I, I think that he can do that even though the attorney general has tried to put a sock in his mouth by saying he's not allowed to talk about judicial reform. I feel like he's just missing. I feel like, you know, he, he, we need yeah. to hear from him. We're yeah. being demoralized by her. We're being demoralized by the media. You're right. I think, first of all, he, have to, he has to galvanize the, the camp that's, that supported the government. And, but I mean, let's not the, forget that the demand for legal reform didn't come from from the politicians. It came from the ground up. I mean, yeah, it's because yeah, yeah. you had my you had you had Israeli community after community that has been <clears throat> that has been directly harmed by the judiciary. It's everybody from the ranchers in the Negev to the uh, so the, the 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 residents of South Tel Aviv who have been overrun. By illegal aliens, they, it's the settlers, it's the ultra orthodox, it's the Ethiopians. I mean, th there's so many different sectors of Israeli society that one after the other after the other felt the weight of the judicial s s oligarchy on their backs. It's not only this, but you know? we, we were talking about uh, Galibar of Miara, the the attorney general. The attorney general, supposedly, she's not attorney. General. She should have prosecuted this guy from Sayeret Matkal, ex uh, who, Ron, who, Ron Scharf, who, 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 did, who vandalized the Kohelet, Kohelet o, uh, offices. This was a barbaric a act. He should have been in jail now. And he was released? I think he was released. And I don't, I, I don't hear that, uh, that anybody is going to charge him on this. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the this selective, is, the this, selective no, this enforcement move, here is shocking. This move against Kohelet with the, the attack, the physical attack on their offices is, sh is one step short of burning books. I mean, you attack a think tank. Uh, it, it's something, it's... Or the, the attack on, uh, on Sarah Netanyahu. Or well, the, and nobody the, was arrested for that either. And the, there are there was another uh, ugly event which is not really a violation, but it was very ugly. You know, people who served in the in the security services gathered near the house of uh, Avi Dichter, pressuring him to 
get out of the government or move against the, the, this legislation. I mean, what kind of uh, democracy brings these people who served the Israeli security, they have no ethos of, uh, of liberalism and of democracy. I think it's, it's very saddening to watch. I don't know, uh, do, do you know, do you, do you remember this event with uh, uh, Carmi Gilon and the various uh, thugs who gathered there? It's amazing that these people that we upheld for generations and, and revered are, are trying to sink the entire country. Uh, because, not all of them, know, it's not the best, the best of them, but it's... Uh, many of them. Many of them, yeah. Look, I think I think that what we're seeing here is, um, I and I truly believe. Kahalani is not one of them. No, Kahalani isn't one of them. Even Shalom, even even, even Mofaz was against them, and Gabi Ashkenazi. You know, I mean, I think, I think that the the the, idea, the losers, the losers of the Halutz. Yeah, the ones uh, who were the the failed uh, chiefs of staff of the IDF and and the Mossad, and you know, they, but it's. It's amazing, like you were talking about the kibbutzim and the, the, the bonds. I mean, it's the same thing with people who serve together in the military. I think sure, that people have a hard time uh, standing I mean, how up to could this it mob. be, how can adults uh, come together like the, the old squad, uh, one of the squads that uh, their fighters were in Entebbe, right? Tsevet mm Amnon. -hmm. Uh, they sent a special letter to Bibi and uh, and his brother Ido. When you read it, you realize immediately that they parrot uh, slogans by a copywriter. Why people who are seventy or seventy-one years old would write would sign such a letter? It's such depravity. I mean, uh, and they're real heroes. Amnon Peled from me, Magan Michael, is the one who, uh, how you, uh, he, he decided the, the fight in Antebbe. He, he crashed first into the, the terminal. room, the terminal, and killed the first uh, terrorists. Why is he doing it? It's, it's, it's very sad. Well, I, I truly believe that, you know, the people of Israel are stronger than this. I think, you know, we've stood up to worse intimidation from them. And I think that if Netanyahu is, and I think he will, you know, he will, uh, he will stand the test of leadership and, um, and we'll get through this. I mean, we are in the middle of a full-blown social con uh, crisis <coughs> and, and constitutional crisis. But I, I think that the, you know, it took so long for, us to get 64, you know, to get over that hump of 61. We got it. We got it on this agenda. And I, and I don't think that there's any going back. If, you know, Netanyahu knows that time is of the essence, we have to take care of Iran's nuclear installations. But I don't believe that if you stand down on this, you can do that. I think that everything is contingent because if he stands down on this, then he won't have a government. He won't have a government anymore to take on Iran. And it's very distressing. All right, well, Amnon, I think we're going to have to leave it there. And, uh, you know. I, I hope we we haven't uh, saddened our, uh, the people who watch this. No, I think that you guys understand that, you know, if things go up and things go down, but our wheel is spinning in our direction. And we won these elections. And the people who voted in the elections <coughs> on November 1st uh, were a much more powerful demonstration of democracy than any number of, of people that you can get to meet in a square at any time. I mean, the real democracy is at the ballot and um, not even in the TV studios. And, uh, and, and we knew what we were doing when we went and we voted. Nobody was deluding themselves to thinking that it was going to be easy, but I don't think we thought that it was going to be this ugly. Uh, but okay, it's this ugly, and we'll just muddle through. It'll be, it'll, it'll be done. It has to be. We don't have any choice. I thank you very much, Amnon, for coming, and I thank you guys for watching. And, thank you, uh, Carolyn. Yeah, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Carolyn Glick Show. And I'm sure uh, uh, you'll be waiting in bait with bated breath, as we all are, to see, you know, how this how this uh, shakes out. 
God willing, uh, it'll be fine.